Hey, Safe Mode. Welcome to Hack to See. I'm Kitty, and I'm here to give you a brief explainer on what UUVs are and what their challenges are. So essentially, a UUV is an unmanned underwater vehicle, or as I like to say, an unpersoned or uncrewed underwater vehicle. Um, underneath the category of a UUV, there are two central subtypes. There's the AUV, the Autonomous Underwater Vehicle, and the ROV, the Remotely Operated Vehicle. And the key difference between these two is one is a self-guided, self-contained system, the AUV, and it makes its own decisions and completes its own tasks without human guidance or interference. The ROV, conversely, is usually, uh, is usually a tethered system, but either way, it's connected to a human who's helping the machine complete its tasks and, and go along its uh, guidance. Essentially, what we're talking about here are maritime robots. Um, so why do we need maritime robots? Well, most of it is about exploring or extracting stuff from the ocean. And what we know about humans and the ocean is that if you put a human under the water on a long enough timeline, they tend to die. So the history of the development of technologies for exploration and extraction used to be about putting a suit around a human or putting a crew inside some sort of undersea shelter that would allow them to do the things they wanted to do. And, and that timeline is quite long. So what you're looking at in this image is an atmospheric diving suit. Um, and that I think is an image from 2014. But more interestingly, the submarine you're looking at, it what essentially looks like a, a barrel with a window on it, um, that model is from the 1700s. So the history of trying to extract and explore the ocean is quite long. The other thing that we tend to do under the ocean, um, largely brought on by a number of world wars, is we do tend to do fighting underneath the sea. And what you're looking at here is an example of an unmanned torpedo. So the way this works is um, this person sits atop this torpedo and in front of this person is, uh, is a timed warhead. And what they do is they guide the torpedo to its location. The driver then drives the uh, manned torpedo over near the enemy ship attaches the warhead and then uh, drops and runs as or swims as fast as they can to get away. Um, so presumably uh, people signing up for this job probably drew the short straw. Uh, but, but this is much of what drives the development, at least for militaries, for the creation of, of, um, of a UUV because this is a, this is a high risk uh, environment. So what we're asking to do at Hack the Sea is for you guys to start thinking about ways to create some battle bots. And so I have three essential easier and harder design sets that you want to start thinking about if you want to play next year um, at, at DEF CON 29. So the easier way to think about this is to tether. And so if you wanted to engage in your battle um, and you wanted to tether your bot, you, you certainly have a lot of access to power, you certainly have a lot of access to data, and your maneuver capability is higher. But this is the easy model. And in all honesty, I would be surprised if we allowed people to operate tethered in this way. The harder challenge, and the one I think we want to see you guys do, is the untethered remotely operated uh, robot. But we will come out with guidance on that challenge pretty soon. But the problem with that untethered remotely operated robot is that under the water, um, radio frequency doesn't work, and so you're pretty much left with sound and, and maybe light. And so um, good luck on that, and we look forward to seeing what you come up with. Another challenge that you want to think about is where on the water do you want to be? And um, we will have separate challenges for that. But essentially, there are three general positions. There's your floaters, there's your swimmers, and there's your bottom crawlers. So your floaters will obviously have more access to light and potentially communication. Your bottom crawlers will be in their most austere position, um, but they will at least be able to locate where they are in the water because they can touch the bottom. And interestingly and quite challengingly, there are your free swimmers, and who even knows how you're going to figure out how to orient yourself in that condition. The other thing that you need to start thinking about is how to power it. So um, the way the military powers things, um, in particular with submarines, is either nuclear power or diesel electric. These are probably not two categories you'll be allowed to use. So I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with. That is about it for my explainer on UUVs. I didn't want to take it on too long, but I do want to say that I know that you see me wearing a bow tie, and that bow tie is really because I want to dedicate this talk uh, to uh, a friend, a colleague, and a mentor, uh, Will Bundy, who passed away this last December. Um, he was a huge part of the Naval War College's move toward innovation, and he was a big proponent of thinking about um, all sorts of unmanned autonomous system. And so um, I just wanted to say thanks, and um, we miss you.
And now that that's done, I figured I would have a little fun at the back end of this video. So um, I tried to think about how to um, work in some sort of reference and a tie between a uh, cocktail and uh, this video and I couldn't, so we're just gonna make a cocktail. Um, so what you're gonna need, let me move my camera, in order to make a Manhattan in the style that I make a Manhattan, is you're going to need some bourbon and you're going to need some vermouth, you're gonna need some bitters, some cherries, some ice, and a way to stir it. Let's give it a shot. Okay, so I tend to make a pretty stiff Manhattan, so I, I just wanna warn you in advance, if you're following my proportions, um, be prepared for a stiff drink. So you're gonna start with your bourbon. Um, I have here something I bought from a local distillery, filibuster. It's a really nice um, standard bourbon. They call it a whiskey because they age it in a different way. So you're gonna take two and a half parts of bourbon. Just one, two and a half. You're gonna grab some vermouth, the sweet vermouth. I tend to use this thing called Carpano Antica, which is considered an Amaro, but that's fancy words. Just get a sweet vermouth. You'll learn over time what your favorites are, and I do one part of that. And then I'm gonna put my bitters in. So I go with two different kinds of bitters. I go with Angostura bitters, and then a little bit of what's called Tiki bitters, but really um, you should play around as much as you want with the bitters until you find out whether you like that deep Christmassy flavor or something more peppery, but that's entirely up to you. Put a little bit of this in here. Healthy dash of Angostura bitters. And the thing that I find that's most interesting and important and also controversial is I believe strongly in uh, the, allowing the flavor of the cherry to come into the Manhattan. And so often what I'll do when I buy my cherries, is when, I, when I put the cherry in the drink, there, see this, was, this is a tethered cherry. And I put just a little bit of the cherry juice into the Manhattan to give it just a little bit more cherry flavor. In the real world, you should be stirring this for somewhere 20 and 30 seconds to get that temperature way down there and to mix all the sugars together. And I have forgotten my skimmer, so I'll just put my finger down here. And that's how you make a Manhattan. I will say for anybody who makes it all the way to the end of this video, hit me up at DEFCON 29 and I will definitely help you make your own Manhattan. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys. Mm. I look forward to seeing the battle box. Take care. Thanks guys. Turn this one off. All right, um, let me turn my, no, my camera's on. Hey guys, uh, I wanted to say thank you. I don't know why my camera's off. Share my screen, who knows? Anyway, in all, in all seriousness, um, the challenge that we're dreaming up for Hack the Sea, um, it, we're hoping to play out in, in uh, 2021. And the kind of challenge we're really looking for is um, is going to be a hard to try and try and do this the hard way, right? So um, there are going to be two categories or classes, and I want to talk a little bit about the swimmers, and then I'm going to kick it over to Grant, and Grant um, is going to talk a little bit about the floaters. And so, um, and in while I'm doing this uh, this this part of the prezzo. Um, feel free to, to, to text in some, some questions and answers. And then after Grant talks a little bit about his challenge on floaters, I want to kick it over um, in a very weird way. You're going to listen to him on my phone because we can't get his audio enabled. Um, you're going to listen to Dave talk about um, undersea IoT, which is uh, a, a growing uh, commonality in, in the water. So, so, okay, so here's the deal. 
um, next summer, we would like to see you folks bring some bots to battle in the water. The swimmer class is going to hopefully operate untethered. Now, what does that mean? That means that all of that, all of those advantages you have normally by um, attaching a tether to your bot so that it can go through an obstacle course aren't going to be there. Um, in particular, one of your greatest challenges is going to be power, and the other one is going to be comms with your bot to get it go through a system. You have all the opportunities you want. If you want to make it an AUV, if you want to make it autonomous, that's great, but you got to be careful, right, because it's an obstacle course. So here are the general rules, and then as we go forward, um, we will be sending out specifics and guidelines. But in general, we're hoping that your bot will not be any bigger then checked luggage, ideally, it will be about the size of carry-on luggage. Why did we do that? We did that because we need you to get your bot to Vegas. And in order to get your bot to Vegas, it's got to fit in some luggage. Otherwise, you'll have a hell of a time getting it here. So checked luggage or carry-on luggage, and we'll be more specific about dimensions going on um, going forward. Uh, I, I can automatically tell that some of you are going to want to know, uh, can it fit in checked luggage? And then I can unfold it. Uh, probably, but we'll figure it out. Ideally, your bot's going to be untethered for power. We can talk later about whether or not you can do a glider motion, which is the, your bot can be underwater and then come up for comms and then go back down again. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a, it's a valid design. We'll think about it. Um, and again, we'll have clear um, guidelines here going forward. Um, we're thinking no more than $1,000 expenditure. So for those of you who are in maker spaces, if you want to put a team together and start thinking about how to build this, um, we really don't want you to be buying the Gucci set. Like, cobble this together, make it work, but do it the hard way. And, and we're looking forward to seeing what you come up with. Like I said, um, reach out to me um, or reach out to Hack the Sea. We're at hackthesea.org. Um, and we will have in the coming weeks the exact specifications um, and the gateways and challenges to get us moving forward. And if you have any other questions, I'm here. But at this point, I'm going to kick it over to Grant, hopefully. And Grant, uh, Grant will talk about the floater class. Hello. How are you? All right. Um, very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Grant from Ocean Builders. We are seasteaders. We are the ones that are uh, famous for building a floating home in the water in Thailand. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, maybe that's not working. Okay, maybe I can't share my screen. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Now something wrong went wrong. Okay, there it is. Okay, so maybe I can't share my screen. Um, I was going to share, show you the uh, some images of the original seastead that we built in Thailand that was very famously uh, attacked by the Thai Navy and ended up turning into a 10-day manhunt by uh, the Thai Navy. So it was a very interesting story. Right now, a book is being written about it as well as a screenplay for a movie. So I'll talk more about that in my official talk tomorrow. Um, but I wanted to talk here uh, about the challenge we're going to be doing for a floater. And for seasteading, something that's really important for us uh, is to be able to have advanced warning if there's big waves or uh, you know see see what's actually going on in the area around us. Um, so we would like to have some notice if there's big storms coming up and things like that. So we uh, and also another purpose is to be able to observe the marine ecosystem around us. So we are. Uh, we want to, have, to build what we call an aqua boy, like a not an aqua boy, like a man, but the actual boys that float in the water, and um, fill it with as many sensors that can give us you know, very useful information as possible. So useful information can be um, water temperature, pH levels, um, salinity, uh, turbidity, um, maybe even cameras connected and collect some data or maybe even have machine learning. Uh, so we'll be putting together the specifications on exactly what all the details are. Uh, we already have a bit of a cheat sheet pinned on our um, on our channel. So you can go and, and download what we have already. It's already there. 
uh, and it'll just give you some information on um, the ideas that we have for what that is, and we'll we'll revise that as we go along here. But uh, we're pretty close to what we want for the specifications of what would be there. Um, ideally, we would have a maximum price and size, of course. Um, it should be something you should be able to bring to Vegas, like Nina was saying, you should be able to transport it there, otherwise it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, and it would look like, it, it could look like something like a normal buoy that you have, you see floating in the water that is kind of used for, uh, you know, the red and green uh, buoys that you see for direction uh, for boats to navigate through some some waterways. Uh, it could be very similar to those in kind of shape, um, and it can take you know can take a under under the water. There would be some a sensor array above the water. Uh, there can be sensors in them as well. So um, it's really unfortunate I can't share my screen, but uh, I was. But I'll uh, maybe have that solved for for the next talk tomorrow. And so I can go through a few of the details here that we had. Um, there's also a link to um, join the challenge. So if anyone here wants to look at the challenge or uh, look at some of the challenges we have that we're going to be doing over the next year, uh, there's a link to a little survey sign up form where you can actually put your name and uh, information and kind of check off what your interests are. And I think we have something very unique because we are like, this is Hack the Sea. Everyone's here to find out how to hack the sea. And this is, I think, a really interesting opportunity. We're at the time where all these technologies now exist for us to be able to do some really fantastic things on the ocean. And uh, so we're we're out there doing it. We're we're seasteaders, we're actually building hardware, we're actually making things happen. And uh, people have been talking about building a city on the sea for decades, but no one's actually done it. So we're actually the first ones that are actually putting hardware together and putting it in the water. So we're really excited about being able to reach people and uh, reach out to a community of hackers that likes building things and is passionate about building things and um, uh, can help us to move everything forward we're really looking for kind of here we're here mostly to do a call of action to say okay here's the opportunities the the sea is wide open with all these incredible opportunities of what we can do and um uh i think now's a really amazing time to actually bring all these things together do a call of action here to anyone that wants to participate and help us do some really interesting things so uh, we'll give a longer talk tomorrow. I'll uh, have some videos and uh, presentations uh, around the whole thing. But I think we can probably pass it along to um, back to Nina, who's going to patch through with Dave on the phone. Thanks a lot, Grant. I uh, Yep, so we got Dave on the phone. I do want to say, just as, a, as an addition to Grant's commentary here, we aren't looking um, to have people bring their proprietary um, um, source stuff right to the to the battle these we're looking for open source hardware and software on this one right we want to be able to share that's the way that works and so um look for that to be a requirement in in uh in in the in the battle guidelines and so all right so um this is awkward as hell but i'm gonna have uh dave speak to you about the underwater iot via my phone so i'm just gonna um I'm going to look to Grant to give me the thumbs up to see if he can hear Dave. Dave, take it away. Okay, can you hear me? I get, oh, there, I get too much feedback here. So I'm kind of flying blind here. I'll do the best that I can. So um, I'm kind of flipping through my PowerPoint here. and um, I, I didn't actually hear Nina's um, video, so I don't really know what she covered in terms of UEBs. But, you know, just to sort of put things in, in context, I guess. Um, you know, EVs, basically unmanned uh, undersea vehicles. And, um, you know. Dave, I'm going to catch up. Stand by one. I'm going to catch up. We're getting way too much echo. Here's what I'm going to do. Um, I think what we're going to do is we will, um, talking to the whole world now, um, 
we, we're going to, um, we may try and ask you to dial in tomorrow and see if we can get you human plus status. So for the, for the universe out there, um, unfortunately, Dave does not have human plus status. And so um, the video and audio functions aren't working. Um, and so we'll have Imprezo out uh, probably following Grant tomorrow, but we'll see if we can spin up. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to take some questions um, in a, and I'll see if I can grab Dave's slides. But but um, just yeah. And then and then uh, just as a takeaway, the the um, the undersea IOT stuff is actually really getting built out uh, pretty aggressively. Dave, what's the timeline you figure? Within the next 10 years, he's next five or 10 years. Okay. As things progress with communications in the undersea, that's the critical path. Okay, uh, Dave, we're gonna we're gonna have you uh, we're gonna have you um, we're gonna get you added to tomorrow's jam. So um, I'll do that on the back end, and let me just take Q and A now. So we'll talk to you in a couple minutes, Dave. Thanks so much for. We'll get there. <laughs> take it easy, man. All right, Grant. If you wanna um, if you wanna unmute, then we'll just take whatever questions come up. Um, or we can just riff until then. Well, I'm really excited to hear about the underwater IoT from Dave. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to hear it. So, okay. So let's, why don't you and I talk about, why don't you and I talk about like, why does it, what's, what's so hard about UUVs? Like what, why does that, you know, we have plenty of flying drones. Like what's the, what's the special challenge about, about being under the water? And, and you can talk about this from the sea setting perspective, and I can talk about it from the naval perspective, but I'll kick it off to you first. Well, it's uh, communication, getting the data from whatever is, uh, when you're underwater, you, you can't send a radio signal um, above, you know, it doesn't, doesn't travel. So that's the, that's the core problem. So if we... <laughs> Go ahead. You know, if, if we can solve that, or if there's a solution or some way of communicating um that would be that would be incredible that could be a game changer so i mean i think this is i mean this I, this can't be stressed strongly enough when i've been talking to roboticists who do undersea stuff um one of the core challenges and why their people are talking about going autonomous with their robots is this problem of communication so um, for those folks who don't play around in the water stuff radio frequency the the way in which comms work uh, wireless comms, um, you know, the way in which our, our drones fly, that is not a thing you get to do under the water. You are left with two sources of signals under the water, unless you count uh, Dave's um, undersea IoT, but you're really looking at light and sonar. Grant, do you know of any other ways besides light and sonar? Sound and light? No. Yeah. I'm not. So, I'm not either. So I'm curious to see what Dave has to see about an undersea IoT. Um, but but really, so now you're talking about a bot that, that 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 is either working on delayed comms, or if you're going to do light, you got to worry about some other problems. And so um, there are also additional issues, which is the bathymetry of the water. So how deep is it? You get different uh, pressure. The farther you go down, you get different um, resistance on the on the hull itself. Um, Grant, are you familiar at all what happens when you put a lithium ion battery encased in a small shell and put it underwater? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't really researched much on. And if the um, battery off gases, what do you have then? Hmm. You have a, uh, you have a I pipe. Yeah. <laughs> so the other problem we're going to deal with in, the, in that UUV category is power. Um, and so I, I, this is a very serious issue, um, that even if you get a really good lithium ion battery in that, in that bot and it's operating autonomously underwater, um, now you have to worry about whether or not it, that the the encasement, the shell, it's right, is is secure enough so to so as to prevent um, a serious problem with that. Uh, the other way you could do it is you could try and create some floater that follows along. But again, this is really up to the to the hackers to figure out. But um, but you know we're really going to try and push you guys on the edges of how much power can you pack into one of those things and make it operate on tethered, and how are you going to get it to communicate? And by the way, if you get really smart ways to communicate, 
I, I'm just assuming other people are going to be messing with you too. I could be wrong about that, but I'm guessing they're gonna. So, um, so the under, so the undersea problem is a real one. Um, the other problem that we're talking about for swimmers is orientation. So for bottom crawling bots, they've got the ground they can orient, right? So now they're left with four directions, forward, back, left, and right. So similarly for floaters, you're going to be uh, on the water surface, forward, back, left, and right. But if you're a swimmer, you have two more dimensions to worry about, and that's up, down. So if you're thinking about trying to orient yourself in the water, not only do you have to figure out where you are with no real touch points, but you've got six directions to worry about. So again, I don't know how our hackers are going to deal with it. I don't know what they're going to do to solve their problem, but I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for them. Um, Grant, do you want to talk about the floater class? Um Yes. So actually, now that you're mentioning it, uh, I talk, we talked with Brian. I talked with Brian uh, about a number of different possible ideas and challenges. And uh, we talked about having a stationary buoy that collects data, sensor data. And then we also talked uh, about having a like a robo boat, basically a robot boat that moves around. Um, and so for the for the floater, are we talking about the moving version or the stationary? I whichever one you're thinking about. I mean, this is for you guys okay. to build out. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, I think the the simplest uh, and probably the best thing to start with would be the uh, stationary that's going to stay in one place. So <clears throat> that is for that is uh, that that technology is really critical for us because we would really like to know. Um, what the conditions are in our area and be able to put those uh, stations in remote areas and collect data before we even decide to ever go there. Uh, so we can actually be collecting data and see what the conditions are year round and if it's a hospitable place to put a seastead. Uh, so it'll just be there collecting data maybe for a year before we would actually move there. Uh, like would collect uh, wave height data, so we'd actually be able to collect the data on whether the buoy was going up and down, what the rate of uh, going up and down is, so we'll be able to see what kind of waves we have, if we have really crazy out of control waves, or if we have uh, slow and steady, very calm that you'd actually want to live in, because living in big waves is not necessarily fun to do. Um, our homes are actually, we've engineered the homes so they actually float above the water. So we're, act, are, we're suspended on a pole that is uh, about two and a half meters above the wave area. So that makes us very comfortable, but still when it's really, really, uh, when the conditions are really wavy, then it's still not, not nice to live in. So um, being able to collect all that data in advance is really good. And we also really want to have uh, clear data that can show the um, the current state of the environment before we put a seastead in that area, because we we don't want to three years from now cause any kind of damage to the local environment, marine environment. We want to make sure that we're our homes we're actually engineering them so that they can be eco restorative and not uh, damaging. Um, so for that, the more clear data we get as a reference, then that, that really helps us out a lot. Grant, I have a question from the audience, but I wanted to do a, a just a, a, a follow-on question to what you're talking about, which is, is there a specific sort of climatological limit to where you're seasteading? What, I mean, is there, you were talking about Thailand, which is a, a, it's a pretty tremendous space, um, but, but are there places where you're like, this is just a terrible idea or the technology is not there yet? Is there an optimal zone for seasteading? Yes, there is. Um, we are in Panama right now, and that is pretty much the optimal location to start because Panama is outside of the hurricane zone. There's a, I think it's seven or 800 kilometer band around the center of the earth, around the equator, where you don't have hurricanes. Just because of the way the Coriolis effect of the earth works, it, you just can't get hurricanes in that area. So that's an ideal place to start because we don't have to worry about uh, moving our home every year when the, the, the hurricane season starts again. So that's an ideal area. Uh, obviously, a lot of people like being in warm, tropical, beautiful areas and Panama 
has a lot of beautiful untouched green um, jungly areas that are beautiful and having your seastead close to land so you have beautiful view of the mountains and the greenery is it's really nice so that kind of an environment is really ideal versus uh, putting it in the north sea uh, in the arctic somewhere or someplace really cold with 100 foot waves uh, that's definitely some place you don't want to be we can engineer them for different conditions like the, the, our our base of our seastead is actually built in the same base as a uh, like an oil rig so we have these deep spars which are poles that go deep into the water that have that create the buoyancy and then you have very heavy weight far below the, them bef below the uh, the spar and that gives you a lot of stability so you have buoy buoyancy as well as stability and then we can just scale that up to something the size of an, an oil rig which can be in pretty nasty conditions but we it's probably some place you don't want to live okay so the question that came in um is is that do we see are we aware of rovers or bots that use vr virtual reality vision um navigation or, or virtual reality vision for for operators do you see any advantage in that or are more traditional methods of computer vision more useful um so this is a this is a question about how the bot understands the environment that it's in. Um, Grant, do you have any early thoughts on that? And then I will, I will I will dial through my mental Rolodex and try and remember a time for the Navy. Go ahead. Um, I think that would be the ideal condition for us to have um, as far as giving people a really good idea of what living on the water can be like, but actually like being able to have them e either remotely or on site where they can actually put on a headset and um, like swim through the water and see underneath the water and see what's going on. If we, if we could give that kind of experience to, to people either remotely or on site that they could actually um, experience it in that way, that would give an, an, a, a dimension that people haven't really had before and to be super interactive and be able to explore the area. And um, so from a tourist kind of a point of view or to get people kind of introduced to this whole new way of living and being, which is totally foreign to most people living on the ocean, that's a, that's a big step for most people. But if you can kind of have those baby steps to give them a vision of some pretty incredible sites that you wouldn't normally see, that would be really, really fantastic. Yeah, so Grant, I agree. Like, I think, I think really, particularly for tourism, um, getting people to sort of buy in and understand what it's like to be down there. Um, I mean, there's something, we are human, right? There's something compelling. We are sense animals. And if you can get more sense that a human can understand down there, that's, that is super helpful. I, I will admit that to my knowledge, Navy, who is not particularly interested in human sense, but is more interested in, you know, sort of targeting, fixing, tracking, like their, their challenge set is already super hard. Um, so for instance, um, so if, if you're a, if you're a big Navy asset and somebody has fired something at you from far, far away under the water, um, like your your biggest concern is by the time you figured out where it is, um, if it has any self guiding capabilities, then um, you're going to try and counter fire. It gets military really fast. You're going to try and counter fire, but you have to try and guess where it's gonna be. Um, and so that's that's so a lot of that stuff isn't really VR relevant. Navy is really thinking about how do I stop someone from hitting me. Really, ninety nine percent of Navy's question is how do I avoid getting struck by something. Um, and so, you know, so, but I love, I love the question about VR because I think it makes me think that we're not thinking broadly enough in the Navy about the way to onboard these new capabilities. Grant, I have another question for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay. So it says, um, do the homes have any built-in capability to collect data from the environment around them? So like, not just sort of like something you, but, but like in and of itself built into the infrastructure of the, of the, of the seastead itself. Uh, yes, we're building as many sensors as we can into the homes to make them um, really, well, we want to make them smartest home on the sea. Well, they will be because there's not a lot of smart, really smart homes on the sea because we're the only ones building. Um, so first level, we have a, uh, 
a weather sensor that's on the roof that detects lightning strikes and detects um, uh, UV, uh, the um, wind direction, uh, and and a whole host of data, humidity, temperature, and um, barometric pressure. And uh, so there's, there's a long list of things that it collects right from there. Um, we will have sensors inside that will detect movement um, because we want to be able to chart what what the movement's like if we are getting uh and it, it, say if you're if you're away from your home for a while and then your home starts moving around for some reason um we would like to be able to give you an alert maybe there's a big storm coming and you can call your neighbor and ask them to close the doors or something or close the windows or you know whatever or or you can just do it remotely from your from your handheld uh from your phone uh so we're building a lot of sensors like that um i can't even there, there's you know there's going to be standard sensors um but environmental sensors we'll have as many as we can we would like to be able to detect uh the temperature of the water at different levels going down we'd like to be able to turn each home basically into research station and document the environment the marine environment we're in because we're out, we're not just trying to make homes on the water we're trying to make homes that are uh, a positive contribution to the environment so part of doing that is to be able to assess what the environment is like and if we're improving it or not improving it so we want to measure the uh, turbidity the uh, alkalinity the uh, ph and uh, well the same thing um uh, and other factors so we can we can see if there's more life uh, after they've our homes have been in the water for uh, for a couple of years or a couple of months or whatever. When we had our home in Thailand, after only two months of being in the water, it went from being like a desert basically underwater, which most of the, the water, most of the ocean is a desert um, when you get far away from the coast. And we're 13 miles away from the coast. So in that case, after two months, we went from having nothing around to having thousands and thousands of fish. So we like having that kind of success story and we like to be able to reproduce that. So we're going to try to use sensors to collect as much data as we can. So this is a, um, I mean, so the, I, so <laughs> sorry, I don't want to make this super military, but please forgive me, Grant. Um, it's, you know, I have to translate for the war types of us out here. So you're talking about an ISR environment and where all that data is going. And I, I wonder what, so if, from a person who doesn't want everything to be about the military, but knows that once the military gets a hold of something, they're going to make it about the military. Um, it's just it's it's a it's a it's an interesting side effect of that mindset. Do you have any security concerns about the data that you're collecting being used against uh, the countries where your homesteads are? That's a terrible. Um, I'm super sorry. Yeah. I had to ask it. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. no security is an issue. Invention. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why um, I already spoke uh, with Brian a couple, well, maybe a week ago, uh, ago about uh, having all of our systems uh, have security threat analysis done on on even each of our sensors, um, all the hardware we're going to be using, all of our systems. And then just have people try to hack it and see what they can come up with and, and try to patch as many of those things as possible. Um, so we're going to, what we want to do is to be able to have all this data and you, you can, you can get your Seastead and not put all the stuff in it, but I would like to be able to collect data and um, we can, as if you're an owner of the Seastead, you can have the option of having that data where that's available to you and only you, and that's encrypted, and you only, you're the only one that has access to it, and we'll probably put it on a blockchain or whatever makes sense to, um, and then you can release the data if you want to share that with anyone else. Um, if you want to share it with, like you can share it with just yourself, you can share it publicly, or you could share it just with like a management company that can see okay, that uh, the sensor at, at your house is showing that your water levels are getting really low and you need to 
I don't know, re replace your something on your, on your home because it's at a critical level. Or if your battery level's too low and your your power system's not going to be able to continue and you're away, then then we can come and help you know take care of that. Our management can, company can come in and take care of that. So so there has to be I think different permission levels for what where your data is going to go, and there has to be really good uh, testing to make sure hackers have a hard time getting in <laughs> as hard as yeah, possible. No, yeah, no, that's I mean it's um, it's interesting because we live in an era where seemingly innocuous information seemingly right i mean this is the big debate not to not to go super meta but this is the big debate about like what's the harm in tiktok right like what is the harm in um we can just say a company but we can also say a country right um both are can can be equally evil what is the harm in um all of this seemingly innocuous data being built up and um so do, not to, and honestly, everybody should tune in tomorrow for, for Grant's talk on CSET specifically, but just to sort of open open the door a little bit, um, what kinds of what kinds of concerns do you have about big data that you, like that you're collecting? Like why who, have you have you thought through what someone might use that stuff for? Um, I'm an optimist, so I always look at as much I, I always look at, towards the positive so i'm looking at what inc amazing things we can do because uh i i genuinely i'm not doing this because i need to do another project uh, i'm doing this because i love doing this and i want to do something that i think we can i think when we build when we build homes on land we kind of destroy the land and you know clear cut the forest and that's not you know it's not a good we're not being a good citizen of the planet but I think there's what I saw last year in Thailand with so much life um, all of a sudden just appearing after just two months. Uh, that gives us an opportunity to actually be a good um, citizen of the planet. So I'd like to, I see this as, uh, I always look at the ways of uh, making an improvement to the situation. And I think we can use data to uh, help improve um, the restoration of coral reefs in the world and so so i'm gonna i'm gonna plus up because there's a question that's come through a little bit further about the telemetry data that you could collect passively uh from these seasteads and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask it specifically because folks are asking and then um and i realize we're, we're gonna run out of time here in about 14 minutes but um and, and and you and i will will again talk through and invite people to um join us in next year's um uh, bot challenge but the the question Again, is are you guys thinking about this from an educational standpoint? Like this, the data you're collecting doesn't. I mean, it, I, you guys are looking to benefit the environment directly, but I mean, is there like is there some sort of um, partnership or subsidies like educational institutes? Like, are you trying to partner um, to try and 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 um, make all of this telemetry have effects beyond just the seasteading element? Um, about two weeks ago, we started reaching out to people that we could partner with. Um, I basically have 150 projects, like huge projects going on simultaneously. So, uh, and it's all filtering through me at the moment. So that's a little this is bit how we know you're a hacker. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to, uh, bring more people on board to, uh, help distribute some of the, the, the research because there's just so much I can do. Um, but I would, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot filtering through me right now. So we need to get a better handle on that. And then, um, I think we'll be in a pretty good position to make, to do some really good things with the data. Um, so I guess uh, partners, there's a lot of people we could partner with, and that's just another project to find the right partners. And uh, I have started to, we have started to look, we started to reach out, to find the right people uh, that would like to partner with us. And we're open to, if anyone has any suggestions, I'm, I'm all ears. Uh, just send it in the chat or on the Seasteading um, channel. Cool. Thank you so much, Grant. All right, so um, we're gonna round us out. Um, actually, StrikePod has a question for us um, that I think we should probably address 
or at least take seriously as we build out our guidelines. He wants to know to what degree um, are COTS products allowed? So, um, so consumer off the shelf products in building either the fl your floater class or my swimmer class. Um, can we can we buy you know some local bot? for 300 bucks and then just repurpose it? And does that stay within our open source guidelines requirement? Um, and I realize that we're asking on the fly because I know you and I were gonna try and sit down together and noodle out exactly what kinds of limitations we wanna slap on these folks for next year. Um, but but do you wanna, you wanna take a stab at, at COTS products? Um, and and then, I'll, and then I'll, I'll give my preliminary thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I really want to have this done in the open source and i guess if that interferes with that then that's like kind of a kind of kills it so if we have if you have if you're buying something off the shelf and then modifying everything on top of that i don't think enough that that would give enough of a open source um component uh, maybe if there's a consumer part that uh, I don't know is maybe like a, I don't know a, an off-the-shelf robot arm or something that could be plugged into the whole system, and that wasn't an essential part of it. Then, then I guess that could be acceptable. But if it's if you're just modifying an off-the-shelf uh, aquatic drone, then I don't I don't think that would be. Like I think the if the guts the core guts of it are are commercial then and closed source then I think I think that would be killer. I, I I think I think I agree. Again, we're we're doing this on the fly as we dream this up. Um, and I'm and, and before we wrap out, I want I'm going to have Grant remind us of what he thinks the the or at least an early um, speculation um, what the floater class requirements are going to be. And I know he's been working up a sheet on that. Um, but I, I'm inclined to say that if you want to use a COTS product for pricing components, right? So we have a thousand dollar limit on the, on the swimmer class. If you want to use a COTS product, you, you would at a minimum need to show me that it has been reverse engineered, um, such that you are really economizing on cost for, you know, private production of a servo. But but you you would at least have to prove to me that like no look it's been reverse engineered and those reverse engineered components are available open source and so a person can sit down and do that stuff I am just cutting to the chase um, and I think that's fair but you'd have to show me that it was that it was the case and and I think that again so for the for the for the swimmer class we're going to have some gates that people are going to have to go through throughout the year because we want to make sure that by the time we get to the to the pool in Las Vegas. Um, we have got some, you know, no shit, seriously interesting bots. They might be dumb, right? They might be running into the wall repeatedly, but then we've got some some bots that, you know, at a minimum, like our full maker gear thought through and are going to behave in interesting ways that we had not anticipated. I mean, part of the fun of the hackerspace is just giving it a shot and seeing all the variation that emerges. It's one of the most beautiful parts of this community is that everybody's teaching us different ways to go at a question. So we're not trying to close that down. In fact, we're trying to open it up, um, which is why we don't want this to be about cuts, right? We don't want this to be about, we want, we, want to, we want you to show us all the ways in which you're coming at, I don't want you to tether for power in a curiously interesting way. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of urine in Vegas pools. Maybe you can use that as a power source. Hard to say, but uh, but you know, sort of speculate and then think your way through it. Um, if we have any luck, um, we will be able to secure a Las Vegas pool to do this in. Um, and so, you know, really just try and get a tan um, a little bit so that you don't die under the Vegas sun. And um, okay, so Grant, I want you as we ramp out of the eight minutes left. Mm -hmm. Give me, again, just to recap for the folks, give me the primary challenges the floater class are gonna come up against. What are the primary, you're like, this, I think this is really the, the issue. Uh, well, a big piece of it would be to be able to collect data and 
store it, but also send it. And sending um, a distance on the water could be could be a little bit tricky, could be a little bit challenging, um, because we may not have a station nearby where we can just we're just sitting there waiting for the data to come in. Uh, but to be useful, we have to be able to collect it. And some of these could be fairly remote uh, in areas that are hard to get to. So it would be very advantageous to have as long of a transmission um, period as possible. I don't know how I will test that in, in Vegas in a pool. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so maybe we'll have a team three miles away and uh, – seeing if they can pick up the sensor data from the pool. Um, that could that could possibly work. Um, so that's going to be really important. Uh, being able to check uh, wave height um, is really important. Interesting, yes. I'm sorry, I haven't been thinking about surface vehicles. Oh, you're totally right. Okay, go on, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Duh, yeah, all would, right, go uh, ahead. We would like to be able to know how, how big the waves are, what what the, the 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 period between the waves is, so uh, all that data is really useful. We'd like to find out if there's a way to find out the direction of the waves um, from sensors. And I was trying to figure out myself how how I would do that. And I haven't put too much thought into it, but I haven't come up with the solution I had on how to do that. Just with uh, with sensors, unless we brought AI or machine learning in and had cameras to Able to be oh, I have so many ideas right now. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, wait, hey, wait, you a flat surface and a couple levels, and you know, you know. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, then, uh, so just standard, uh, we can collect standard weather uh, data as well. Um, probably we'd want to know uh, lightning data as well, if there's a lot of lightning strikes in that area. We might not love to be in that area if there's a lot of lightning in, uh, coming down in that area. So that's a condition. Um, you know, so we're going to see which are the most important items for us to have on this list uh, as a final specification. Uh, solar powered would be nice so they can last as long as possible and we don't have to go out and change the batteries every, every week. Um, if it could be continually charged, that would be, that would be ideal. Um, so those are, I think, some of the, the more important things. And, of course, collecting any kind of water data we can, like pH or salinity, um, temperature, turbidity, um, cameras under the water that can identify fish with machine learning would be really cool as well. Oh, interesting. Wow. So that's so honestly, that's that's going to be VR, right? That is going to be. I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone's got a, I don't think anyone's got a massive database of fish signatures. I mean, maybe tuna if you're lucky. Yeah. Uh, gosh, I don't. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. But yeah, like, what does a fish look like, and how is it not a plastic bag? And interesting, interesting. Okay, all right. Um, uh, so from a naval perspective, and, and, and you folks know me, like I don't have to talk. I, I will talk from this perspective because I think because I think it's different because I think it's complete contrast into what into what Grant's talking about, and I love what Grant's talking about. I think it's fascinating. It's amazing. I think it's useful for the future. Um, uh, but in contrast, right? Like, what are some other kinds of challenges? So Grant's talking about survival of a floater. He's talking about persistence. He's talking about integrity of the data long enough to you can fetch it back. And I think that all of those things also matter um, when it comes to things like um, how do how does a Navy project power or at least protect uh, vessels that are going along in the sea? Like one of the real issues at play for Navy is for all navies, not just the US Navy, is how do we protect um, where so much of the world's commerce comes from. So for folks who don't know, right, all the items, probably the vast majority of the items that you have running around in your house come to you via a boat. They come via a ship. They float on the surface. 
And one of the things that navies and coast guards are required to do is ensure the safe passage of these objects, right? And if we're all impatient Amazon consumers, then we want it now. Um, and so the question is, you know, how do you prevent those kinds of delays? How do you ensure freedom of navigation, freedom of the sea? So it's a Navy question. For Navy, um, these, the, the, the biggest concerns are about following things. The biggest concerns for the Navy are which of these, we call them white, white, um, we call those white ships, white ships being ships that aren't, um, aren't out there with a military capacity. They're there to, you know, bring tourists around or they're there to uh, uh, move cargo from China to the US, right? This is white. Um, so how do you tell the difference between white and other forces? How do you then, once you've identified these other elements that could be doing terrible things or might be trying to do terrible things, um, how do you follow them in a meaningful way without having to send out a ship and, and literally follow it, right? Um, and so really the question for the floater swimmer class for us is about locating something almost passively, right? From an IR, ISR perspective, almost passively, just, just being able to sort of map who's who in the zoo and where are you heading this week? And, and honestly, so Gary Kessler is going to talk to you folks actually in the next hour, I think, um, about hacking AIS. And AIS is the system by which all ships voluntarily um, share their data, their tracking data as they transit the seas. And um, there's a real reason to be concerned about that system. And so, um, so we'll worry about that, those security, uh, that security in the next session. Um, anyway, so uh, we're going to say goodbye because I think we're down to our last minute. Um, uh, I love you all. Um, talk to you all soon and I miss you. Go ahead, uh, Grant, say goodbye. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow on uh, my talk. Uh, I think it's at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye.